the year you want to move forward, uh, please, please take advantage and do that. Hopefully, uh, I can make this work. But side side buttons, Marty. Yep, I got it. Got it. But uh, I thought lots of things. Thought lots of, uh, and actually, there's an even a different title in the book. But really, really, my presentation this morning is, gonna, is about why are we here? Why are we here at Trinity today? And uh, why have you folks come? And why have you come in the past? And this was going to be the title of my presentation. Rob mentioned the technology and all things you don't want to hear about, but I was, he asked me to talk about causal mutations, genetic imputation, and the new and exciting era of bioinformatic technologies. But you guys would all leave, and I wouldn't have it. And uh, I'm not even qualified to speak on that either. This is, this is important stuff, but it's not things that you're going to have to deal with most of you in your personal lives. Lots of traditional realities in this business. Lots of traditional realities, and those realities and those paradigms are changing as we move forward. I'm not going to go through the whole list because I'm going to shorten up some of the things, but some of the stuff down here at the bottom is the most important part because, again, the paradigms are changing. Relationship-based business is changing, and genetics is becoming more important. Because ultimately, in this business, just like in every other ag business, or shoes, or cars, or anything, you're going to be paid for what you produce. We're the, we're the last man standing, or woman standing in a, in a business, in a food business where folks are paid for what they produce, and we need to be prepared and better prepared for that. One of our challenges has been that we don't sometimes do a very good job of defining our target. Some branded programs define their target extremely well. This is exactly what we want, and this is exactly what you have to do to benefit from it. But as an industry, we've been more of a sorting industry, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. How do we make decisions? How do we define what great genetics are? We all know the answer. Tradition is sure an important part of it, including our family, maybe our ag teacher, maybe today the internet. But Trying to define what great genetics are in the beef business is significantly different than it's been in any other competing foods, including green beans and apples. They can find what great genetics are all the time. And definitely, we haven't defined great genetics by ivory tower academics or beef chains or consumers. And I think that's going to change. Because this is the legacy that we've had in struggling to define great genetics. And this is a challenge for our business. This is a challenge for efficiency in our business. Uh, and these folks, these folks define great genetics substantially different than these folks do. In Hereford Cattle, in the South, they might define them differently. This, I, I want to see that steer. I hope that gal's really short. But I would like to see, you know, this, at the petting zoo someplace. But ultimately, that animal probably end up in the food chain as well. And we've been from here to here to here to here. We've defined it so many different ways that we haven't made any progress. Because every time we change gears and run the other way as fast as we can, we, we suffer all the loss of progress that we tried to make in the last year. This one here's my favorite. He was, he's defined as great genetics because he has great hair. And I'm not just, I'm not just, I'm just sour grapes. But the, the, the shots people, uh, anyway. Undescribable. Here, we sometimes we even can't define our product or great genetics based on the product we produce. And yet certainly there's place in the market for this highly marbled Wagyu Kobe type beef, this grass-fed ultra lean kind of beef, this commodity making thousands of them, high quality, high cutability, eat, uh, cheaper to produce kind of beef. And I'm not sure who makes that beef, but if you could make it, you could probably sell it. At least on the internet, you put that on the internet, you sell thousands of them. So how about if we start defining great genetics based on the profitability that they generate, not only for our own operation, but for the rest of the beef business. These folks do it. These folks do it pretty well. So this is, I was actually going to have a judging class if we had more time. You know, one, we only had three, but you'd have to judge them. Two, three, one, one, two, three. The point is that there is no difference. They still do performance testing, collect information just like we do because you have to, to develop genomic tests and move forward in the business, you have to do performance testing. But ultimately they define the great genetics based on predictability and uniformity 
based on the rate and level of genetic improvement and based on the impacts of their genetics on the industries and customers. And then those products are guaranteed. They're guaranteed to work. And you say, well, corn is different to beef cattle. And it is different to beef cattle. However, we're raising corn in Canada now and corn in Mexico. Genetically, they conquer lots and lots of different environments, but it's built around these things. And that's what we're going to have to build our genetics around too, and that's what we're doing in our business. Because here's the cattle business. Here's the corn business moved into the cattle business. We got some Charlet corn here. Well, I guess corn. I'm not sure. This might be short home corn. I'm not positive. But this is both a challenge and an opportunity. This is a challenge if you're trying to sell products or, or create uniformity. It's a challenge. If you're trying to create great products, there's genes in every one of those that can be grabbed and moved into here and combined with this and combined with that to make a product that's truly superior for this business. Okay, all the, all the fun slides are done. I'm trying to get through those fast. All the fun slides are done. Here's the crux of, of the issue. And I'm going to get to a, a point here in three or four slides from now, but genetics in the cattle business is not like genetics in the corn business or some other because it's such a long-term proposition. There's nothing short-term in our business. If you purchase bulls this spring, or you go out here right now and purchase them in 2017, First calves born in 18, so you know a little bit about their calving needs, maybe fertility, bull fertility by then, hopefully bull fertility. First daughters grown up and bred in 19, first daughters calve in 20, so the bulls you buy right now, you're not going to know that much about the, what they brought to your herd maternally until well, 2020 and well after that. Last calves, if those bulls last like they should, maybe born in 21, 22, 23, Last calves in 2017, which means in 2032, which I might not be around in 2032, but if I was, your 10-year-old cows are the daughters of the bulls you purchase right now. And we don't think about that. We don't think about that when we're trying to make decisions on sale day and we show up at 1230 and the sale starts at 1. We're not thinking about 2032, otherwise we'd have got here before lunch huge gravity in the decisions that we make in this business. There's no short term, not even in the industry. The 10 year olds in 2028 are genetically determined right now for the entire beef industry, not only in this country, but every country in the world. So making change for value and making change in products takes forever. So we cannot afford the old system of up and down and back and forth and no, uh, no definition of product. For Trinity Farms, it's an even bigger deal. And it should be for you as a Trinity Farms customers because the matings they make in 17, born in 18, yada, 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 all the way down the line. And you say, well, you know, when I come here, and this is in general true, the meat of the bulls, the better end of the bulls, are about four and five and six year old cows. So the bulls that you purchase in 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, their dams were made in 2017 or maybe 2016. Half the genetics of those bulls is already determined. So these, they have to really, and Tom brought up the technology part of things, the technology to them is incredible in terms of the long-term value to their program. But then if you back up and plug 2022, three, four, five, eight in here, and make this number about 2040 from the genetics decisions they're making at Trinity Farms right now or made this spring. As the gravity of the decisions, the gravity of the situation uh, is, is huge. So with that in mind, if you're going to think about that, think about your bull purchases, and Trinities are thinking about the bull, the cattle that they're developing genetically, they've got to be thinking about the 30s and 40s, and so do you. What's going to matter? These are, these are toss-ups. I would guess cavities and maternal traits and growth and efficiency and things like that are going to matter. I don't think I'll get much argument from those things. Beef quality and value, I think it's going to matter more. If, if I'm going to throw my chips in, like we would here the night before the sale, throw my chips in, I'm going to say beef quality and value is going to matter more. Marketing going to be different in the 30s and 40s from you as a cow-calf producer? Yeah. I, I would be, I'd be shocked if it's not different. Might not be, but I'd be shocked if there aren't changes there. So my decisions need to be pretty robust. When it comes to marketing options, if I'm going to you know, make good risk-wise decisions uh, for my genetic programs, 
Cost of production going to go down? Yeah. <laughs> I never say, I never heard anybody say yes. I never hear anybody say yes. Say yes every time. No. I think the answer that's no. We're all good with that. Profit is going to matter. I think it'll matter more. And good news is the value of heterosis not going to go away in the 2030s and not 2040s. Not going to go away. Matter of fact, some of the technology we have in place, it may actually get to be a bigger deal. So whose responsibility is it? Whose responsibility is it to define great genetics and produce great genetics so the commercial cowherds of this nation can be more profitable all the way in the 2040s? This is a $150 billion industry at a consumer level. The dollars that are flowing back through our system. $150 billion. And from time to time, the genetic decisions we make are random. I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense. We've used a crystal ball for years. I still do some days. I'm trying to get away from that a little bit more. I'm trying to use some decision making tools. It's going to take science and technology. And in the future, and the reason why I'm here today is in the future, source just might be everything. Because wherever your source is headed genetically, so are you. If you buy all your seed stock in one place, the decisions, as I showed on the one slide, that they made in 2017, you continue to buy seed stock from those folks, it's going to impact your herd into the 30s and 40s easily. Maybe until your kids or the next generation is running the ranch. So sources, source is crucial. You can't make decisions within a source outside of the direction that they're heading if you do it in the long term. So what's their plan for the future? Do they use technology and facts, and do they have their best interest in mind or yours? I say by the size of the crowd, you feel like it's yours, and that's good. And in the future, just like today, service and service and service and service, in addition to genetic improvement, because that's the only two things that genetic sources have to offer you. In the past, reputation-based genetic source, maybe with some information, maybe not, uh, it's been real traditional. Shoot, I know a lot of folks that buy them from their relatives because Christmas wouldn't be nearly as good if they didn't buy the bulls from their relatives. I'm not sure business-wise whether that's a good decision or not. I hope your relatives have got their poop in a group. Um, we'll make decisions for genetic source. Magazine ads and pretty pictures sometimes. I, I talk to some, some people, it's like, I've been buying bulls there for 15 years. But this year, I'm going to these folks because their pictures are better. I think it's some bulls in their pictures that are really nice. I think I've been buying from this place for 15 years. We love the bulls. Yeah, but their pictures aren't as nice. $150 billion business. We made the decision based on who had the prettier pictures. I don't get it. Logical, detailed search for source and what their commitments are, what their commitments are to you as a customer. It's the most important decision you'll make in the future unless you want to learn all about bioinformatics and gene technology. Unless you want to learn that stuff yourself, you need to hook your wagon to somebody that does. Let them make those decisions. Let them move in a positive direction and you take advantage of their efforts by purchasing seed stock from their, from their place. It's the most important decision that we'll make as a commercial producer and I would argue that at Allied, it's the most important decision that I make because we choose the seed stock herds that we're going to work with based on their commitment to the future and customers. All these things are important and I absolutely avoid the sources who discourage the use of data and EPDs because they do not have your best interest in mind, they have their best interest in mind. Just a little list of questions, I won't go through all of them, but you need to build this kind of relationship with your seed stock producer so that you can ask them about their priorities. You can ask them about their long-term plans to keep you successful. You can ask them how they make selection decisions. Do they use data? Do they collect and use the data to help move the whole industry forward? What kind of service and warranty do they offer? And finally, can we spend some time going through your cows and looking at your operation? Because that you go, they go is true. Whatever their cows look like today, plus or minus a little environment, is what yours are going to look like 10 and 20 years from now if you continue to use these programs. Do you like the size of the cows? Do you like the udders and feet? Do you like the nutritional requirements of them? Are the maternity chains rusty or not rusty? You need to know. Do these cattle act the way I like my cattle to act at home? Because they're making your genetics decisions for 15 and 20 years from now. You need to be very, very comfortable 
with their calendar and with what they do and with what they produce? How does their data look? What does their carcass traits look like? What does their fertility data look like? Those are the kind of questions you need to ask when you're finding uh, genetic sources. Those are the questions that we ask in our business before we ask any one of now up to about 86 seed stock producers that we work with. We ask those questions to them before they join our business because it's important to the reputation and future of our business as well. I'm not going to ask for any questions because I'm going to be up here all day and we need to keep moving. <laughs> I, know, I know it's ready to come up here. But uh, again, I'll be back up here later today. Just some things to start to think about.